The Fire Plume The season had begun when fish are plenty near the shore of the lake. Wasimo, setting out early in his canoe, had made his way along the shore to a fishing ground where he had spread his nets. It was evening now, and as he pulled in the nets he saw that he was fortunate, for here and there the meshes were white with fish. Immediately he set a kettle on his campfire, and soon the fish were boiling. When they were done, he removed the kettle and, taking a wooden ladle, skimmed off the oil, for the fish were very fat. He had a torch of twisted bark in one hand to give light, but when it came time to remove the fish, he did not know how to hold it. Taking off his leg bands, he wrapped them around his head and tied up the lighted torch so that it rose from his forehead in a feather of flames. With both hands free, he began to take out the fish, every now and then moving his head as he blew off the oil from the broth. As he hastened to remove the last of them, blowing repeatedly over the kettle, the plume of fire above his head waved brilliantly in the air. Suddenly he heard a laugh. Looking out as far as the torch threw light, he saw two beautiful young women smiling at him. Charmed by their appearance, he started toward them. But just as he was about to speak, he fell unconscious, and both he and they vanished together. Recovering his senses, he found himself in a superb lodge extending as far as the eye could see. Someone spoke to him, saying, Stranger, awake and take something to eat. He arose and sat up. On each side of the lodge there were rows of people sitting in regular order. At a distance he could see two prominent persons who looked older than the rest and who appeared to command obedience from all around them. They were the old spirit and his wife. The old spirit addressed him, saying, Son, my daughters brought you here. They saw you at the fishing ground. When you tried to approach them, you fell unconscious, and they brought you underground to this place. I have often wished to have one of your people live with us. If you can make up your mind to remain, I will give you one of my daughters in marriage. Wasmo dropped his head and made no answer. By his silence, he gave his assent. All of your wants shall be supplied, said the old spirit. Here is my daughter, take her, she shall be your wife. And from that time on they sat beside each other in the lodge and were considered as married. Then the wife of the old spirit spoke and said, Daughter, your husband cannot eat what we eat. You must get him what he is accustomed to. In reply, the daughter pushed her hand through the side of the lodge and took a white fish out of the lake. Every day from that time on she used the same method, giving her husband trout, pike, sturgeon, or whatever kind of fish he desired. Likewise, she would give him the meat of any animal or fowl. For animals walked over the roof of the lodge. Birds sat upon its poles, and the waters came so near to its side that the spirits had only to reach outside for whatever they wished. One day, the old spirit said, Son-in-law, I am in want of tobacco. You shall return to visit your parents and make known my wishes. The distance is short to your village. A path leads directly to it. And when you get there, do not forget my requests. Wasimo promised to do as he was told and soon set out together with his wife. They followed a path to the top of a rise, then walked a short distance under the lake, emerging from the water at a point not far from the village. When they arrived, the people were thrown into a state of commotion. All were anxious to see Wasimo, for they had thought him dead. While the excitement was at its height, he entered the lodge of his parents. They were filled with joy to see him. He related all that had happened to him, how he had attached the fire plume to his head and how he had disappeared from the campsite. He told them where he had been and how he had come to be married. They were astonished at his wife's beauty and more so at her ability to converse with them in their own language. All was joy in the village. There was nothing but feasting. 
People came from nearby villages to offer them welcome and to present their tobacco to the old spirit's daughter and her husband. In return, they asked that the spirits grant them long life, success in hunting, and a plentiful supply of food. Wassimo promised to convey each of their requests to his father-in-law. So much tobacco had been offered that it filled two sacks of moose skin. On the outside of these skins, each person painted his own family mark or totem to show who had given the tobacco. When the time came for Wassimo and his wife to leave, he told his relatives not to follow them and disappeared. Taking the tobacco, they said goodbye to all, all but one cousin who had been Wasimo's closest companion. He insisted on going with them a distance, and when they got to the edge of the lake, he urged them to take him with them. Wasimo told him it was impossible, that it was only spirits who could grant the power to make such a journey. With great affection, then, they parted. The cousin watched as they walked into the water. He returned home and told his family and friends that he had witnessed their disappearance. When Wasimo and his wife reached their home under the lake, the old spirit greeted them with open arms. They presented him with the tobacco and told him all the requests of the people above. He promised he would attend to them all, but before he could do so, he must first invite the other spirits to come share the tobacco and smoke with him. The great coming together of the spirits was a promptly arranged, and toward the middle of the day they began to arrive. There were spirits from all parts of the country, some good, some wicked, some dangerous. Suddenly, when most had arrived, Wassimo heard the roaring and foaming of waters. Rushing in, they passed through the lodge like a raging storm. Tremendous pieces of rock Old trees, logs, stumps rolled past and were swept away in the current. The spirit of waterfalls had arrived. Next they heard the roaring of waves as if beating against a rocky shore. In a few moments the waves of the lake rolled into the lodge, mountain high and covered with silver sparkling foam. Wasimo felt their pressure and with difficulty clung to his seat for each one seemed as if it would overwhelm him. This was the spirit of the islands and the surrounding lake. At last, all the spirits were gathered, including the guardian spirit of Wasimo's tribe. The old spirit arose and addressed the assembly. Brothers, he said, I have invited you to share with me this offering made by the mortals on earth, which has been brought to us by my son-in-law. Brothers, you see their wishes and desires. And he pointed to the totems covering the tobacco-filled moose skins. Brothers, he continued, the offering is worthy of our consideration. Brothers, I see nothing on my part to prevent our granting their requests. They do not appear to be unreasonable. One thing more I would say. Brothers, it is this. My son-in-law is a mortal. I wish to keep him with me, and it is in our power to make him one of us. Hokay, hokay, ran through the whole company of spirits. Thus they signified their approval. The tobacco was then divided equally among them. They would grant the request of the people on earth, and also the request of the old spirit regarding his son-in-law. When the company had left, the old spirit told Wasimo that he must once more visit his parents and relatives. It is merely to tell them that their wishes are granted and then to bid them farewell forever. Shortly thereafter, Wasimo and his wife set out once again, bringing with them the message that the people's request for long life, good hunting and plentiful food had been granted. Now, said Wasimo, I must bid you all farewell. His parents and friends raised their voices in loud lamentation. They went with him to the edge of the lake, where they all seated themselves to see him make his final departure. The day was mild, the sky clear. Not a cloud appeared, nor a breath of wind to disturb the bright surface of the lake. The most perfect silence reigned throughout the company. They gazed intently on Wasimo and his wife as they waded out into the water.
waving their hands. They saw them go into deeper and deeper water. They saw the waves close over their heads. All at once they raised a loud and piercing wail. They looked again. A red glow as if the sun had glanced on the wave marked the spot for an instant. But the feather of flames and his wife had disappeared forever. Wawonosh. Wawonosh was the head of an ancient family of his tribe, which had preserved the line of chieftainship unbroken from a remote time. To the reputation of birth, he added the advantages of a tall and commanding person and the impressive qualities of strength and courage. His bow was noted for its size and the feats he had performed with it. His counsel was sought as much as his strength was feared so that he had come to be equally regarded as a hunter, a warrior, and a counselor. He had now passed the prime of his days, and the term Aki Wazi, meaning one who had been long on the earth, was applied to him. Wawonush had an only daughter, a handsome young woman who had lived through eighteen springs. Her father was not more celebrated for his deeds of strength than she for her slender grace, her dark eyes, and dark flowing hair. Many were the young men who sought her hand, but only one had found favor. He was a young hunter of humble parentage, who had no merits to recommend him other than a tall, straight frame, a manly step, and a youthful face beaming with love. The daughter longed to return his love, but the father remained unmoved. Wabonush sought an alliance more suitable to the rank and high pretensions of his family, Listen to me, young man, he replied to the trembling hunter who had come to seek his approval, and be attentive to my words. You ask me to bestow upon you, my daughter, the chief comfort of my age and my choicest gift from the master of life. Others have asked of me this boon who were as young and as eager. Many have had better claims to become my son-in-law. Have you considered the deeds which have raised me in authority and made my name known to the enemies of my nation? Where is there a chief who is not proud to be the friend of Wawanosh? Where is there a hunter who has excelled Wawanosh? Where is there a warrior who has taken an equal number of scalps? Have you not heard that my fathers came from the east bearing the mark of chieftaincy? Think not that my warrior blood shall mingle with yours. None but the brave can ever hope to claim an alliance with the family of Wawanosh. Go then, young man, and earn a name for yourself. The intimidated young hunter departed. He was determined to do a deed that would make him worthy of the daughter of Wawanush, or die in the attempt. He called together a number of his young companions and told them of his plan to lead an expedition against the enemy and asked for their assistance. Several of them took to the idea immediately. The others were soon persuaded and before ten suns had set, he found himself at the head of a formidable party of young warriors. Like himself, all were eager to distinguish themselves in battle. Each warrior was armed with a bow and a quiver of arrows tipped with flint or jasper. Each carried a sack filled with pounded corn mixed with pemmican or maple sugar. All were provided with war clubs of hard wood fastened to belts of deer skin. In addition to knives of stone or copper, some carried the ancient shemagun, a long pole with a spearhead of flint firmly tied on with deer's sinews. Adorned with feathers, the bodies painted, they gathered together for the war dance. Their leader was distinguished by the feathers of the bald eagle. As he led them around a bright fire of pine wood, he chanted, Hear my voice, birds of war. I prepare a feast for you to feed on. I see you cross the enemy lines. Like you, I shall go. I wish the swiftness of your wings. I wish the vengeance of your claws. I must, my friends, I follow your flight. Come, you young men warriors, bear your anger to the place of fighting. Then, suddenly halting, they raised the war cry, and the dance immediately began. An old man sitting at the head of the ring beat time upon a drum, while several of the older warriors shook rattles that made the woods echo with their song. 
Here on my breast have I bled, see my battle scars, mountains tremble at my yell, I strike for life. The dance continued with short pauses for two successive days and nights. Often during a pause, the medicine man who led the ceremony would address them with words of encouragement. Then the dance would begin again with renewed vigor. Again the young men would chant, from the south they come, the birds, the warlike birds with sounding wings. I wish to change myself to the body of that swift bird. I throw away my body in the strife. At length the medicine man uttered his final prediction of success. One by one the warriors dropped away from the fire, each making his way to the appointed meeting place at the edge of the enemy's country. Their leader was soon to join them, but not until he had sought out the daughter of Wawanush. He warned her of his determination never to return unless he could establish his name as a warrior. He told her of the humiliation he had suffered at the harsh words of her father. Never could he be content with or without her until he had proved his courage to the entire tribe. Again he told her of his great attachment to her. She, too, pledged her love, and they parted. After this last meeting, the only news she was ever to receive from her lover was brought to her by one of his warriors, who reported that he had distinguished himself by the most heroic bravery. But at the end of the battle he had been shot through the breast. The wound had been beyond the power of the young warriors to cure him. They had carried him a day's journey toward home, when, greatly weakened, he had finally died in their arms. From that moment on, there was no more happiness for the daughter of Wabanush. Refusing to take food, she passed her days and nights in solitude, often withdrawing to a lonely spot in the forest where she would sit beneath the boughs of a tree for hours at a time. It was not long before a small bird of beautiful plumage flew into the tree under which she usually sat. It was a strange bird, such as had never been seen before. Every day it came and sang, remaining until dark. Her imagination soon led her to suppose that it was the spirit of her lover, and her visits to the forest became more frequent. Still she fasted, growing weaker with each passing day, until the death she so eagerly desired finally came to her relief. After her death the bird was never seen again and it became widely believed that this mysterious creature had flown away with her spirit. But bitter tears of regret fell in the lodge of Wawanush. Too late he regretted his false pride and his harsh treatment of the noble youth. The Broken Wing There were six young falcons living in a nest, all but one of whom were still unable to fly, when it happened that both the parent birds were shot by hunters in one day, the young brood waited with impatience for their return. But night came, and they were left without parents and without food. Grey Eagle, the eldest and the only one whose feathers had become stout enough to enable him to leave the nest, assumed the duties of stealing their cries and providing them with food. But after a short time had passed, he, by an unlucky accident, got one of his wings broken in pouncing on a swan. This was especially unlucky because the season had arrived when they were soon to go south for the winter, and they were only waiting to become a little stronger and a little more agile before setting out on the journey. When Grey Eagle did not return, they decided to go in search of him and found him sorely wounded and unable to fly. Brothers, he said, an accident has befallen me, but do not let this prevent your going to a warmer climate. Winter is rapidly approaching and you cannot remain here. It is better that I alone should die than for all of you to suffer miserably on my account. No, no, they replied with one voice. We will not forsake you. We will share your sufferings. We will abandon our journey and take care of you as you did of us before we were able to take care of ourselves. If the climate kills you, it shall kill us. Do you think we can so soon forget your brotherly care, which has surpassed a father's and even a mother's kindness? Whether you live or die, we will share your fate. They sought out a hollow tree, carried the wounded nest mate there, and before the rigors of winter set in, they stored up enough food to carry them through. To make sure it would last, two of them went south, leaving the other three to feed and protect their older brother. 
In due time, Gray Eagle recovered from his wound, and he repaid the kindness by giving them instructions in the art of hunting. As spring advanced, they began to venture out of their hiding place and were all successful in getting food to eke out the winter stock, except the youngest, who was called Peepy Jeewee Zanes, or Pigeon Hawk. Being small and foolish, flying hither and yon, he always came back without anything. At last, Gray Eagle spoke to him and demanded the cause of his ill luck. It's not my smallness or weakness, said Peepy Jeewee Zanes, that prevents me from bringing home food as well as my brothers. I kill ducks and other birds every time I go out, but just as I get to the woods, a large owl robs me of my prey. Don't despair, brother, said Gray Eagle. I now feel my strength perfectly recovered, and I will go out with you tomorrow, for he was the most courageous and warlike of them all. Next day they went forth together, the older brother seating himself near the lake, Peepy Jeewee Zane started out and soon pounced on a duck. Well done, thought his brother, who saw his success. But just as he was reaching the woods with his prize, up came a large white owl from a tree where he had been watching and laid claim to it. He had nearly wrested the duck from Peepy Jeewee Zane's when Gray Eagle came up and, fixing his talons in both sides of the owl, flew home with him. The little pigeon hawk followed him closely and was overjoyed to think he had brought home something at last. When they had alighted, he flew into the owl's face and wanted to tear out his eyes. Gently, said the gray eagle, do not be so revengeful. This will be a lesson to him from now on not to steal from anyone who is weaker than himself. So after giving him good advice and telling him what kind of herbs would cure his wounds, they let the owl go. While this was taking place, and before the owl had yet got out of sight, two visitors appeared at the hollow tree. These were the two nestmates who had just returned from the south after passing the winter there. Thus they were all happily reunited, and each one soon chose a mate and flew off into the woods. Spring had now revisited the north. The cold winds had ceased. The ice had melted, the streams were open, and the forest once again became green. The Red Swan. For Jibwe, the youngest of three brothers, was out hunting one day when he caught sight of a bear. According to a family agreement, the bear was not his to kill. It was reserved for his older, more experienced brothers. Hesitating for a moment as if to test his own daring, he found that he felt no fear within his breast, but rather a surge of defiance. Boldly he claimed the bear for himself, and taking careful aim with his sure and steady arm, felled it with one shot. Suddenly, just as the bear was hit, a reddish glow brightened the surrounding air. Ojibwe rubbed his eyes, thinking it must be an illusion, but the red glow persisted. Off in the distance he heard a sound like a human voice, yet strangely different from any voice he had ever heard before. He stopped to listen. Again he heard it and felt it calling to him. So strongly did it lure him that in his eagerness to follow it he forgot the bear he had slain only a few moments before. Pushing ahead through the brush he came out on the shore of a small lake and saw immediately the object that had attracted him. There in the water sat a magnificent red swan, its plumage glittering in the sun. Now and again it made the same curious sound he had heard before. He was within bowshot, and pulling the arrow from the bowstring up to his ear, he took his aim, but the arrow missed. Again and again he shot till his quiver was empty. Undisturbed, the swan moved around in circles, stretching its long neck and dipping its bill into the water. Ojibwe ran home and got all his own and his brother's arrows and shot them all away. He then stood and gazed at the beautiful bird. Suddenly he remembered his brothers saying that in their deceased father's medicine sack were three magic arrows. Off he started without hesitation, so great was his desire to have the swan. At any other time he would have considered a sacrilege to open his father's sack. Neither of his brothers would have dared to do so. But now he hastily seized the three arrows and ran back, scattered over the lodge. The swan was still there. With great precision he shot the first arrow and came very near the mark. 
The second came even closer. As he took the last arrow, he felt his arm go firmer. Drawing it back with all his strength, he let it go and saw it pass through the neck of the swan a little above the breast. Still the bird did not appear injured. It waited a few moments, then slowly began to flap its wings. Gradually it rose into the air, flying off toward the sinking of the sun. Ojibwe started after it, running as fast as he could. As he rounded the lake, he spied several of the arrows he had shot from the opposite shore. Hastily he retrieved them and continued on. So great was his speed that he would shoot an arrow, catch up to it, and even pass it. Through deep woods, past lakes and streams, down valleys and over prairies, he ran toward the red sky in the west. Just before nightfall, after taking one last run, he began looking about for a place to rest. I can run fast, he thought, and tomorrow when the sun has risen I will sooner or later catch up to the swan. Emerging from the forest, he found himself in a large clearing. Farther on were lodges and sounds of men chopping wood. Tired though he was and in need of refreshment, the thought of the swan remained uppermost in his mind as he made his way toward the village. Drawing near, he heard the voice of the watchman crying, We are visited! He advanced, and the watchman directed him to the lodge of the chief. It is there you must go in, he said, and left him. Come in, come in, take a seat, said the chief, pointing to the side where his daughter sat. It is there you must sit. They gave him food, and since he was a stranger, asked him but few questions, waiting for him to speak first. After dark, the chief said to his daughter, Take our son-in-law's moccasins and see if they be torn. If so, mend them for him, and bring in his bundle. Ojibwe thought it strange that he should be so warmly received and given a wife so soon without his wishing it. It was some time, however, before she would take his moccasins. It displeased him to see her so reluctant, and when she did fetch them, he snatched them out of her hand and hung them up himself. He lay down and thought of the swan and made up his mind to be off by dawn. He awoke early and spoke to the young woman, but she gave no answer. He touched her lightly. What do you want, she asked. And she turned her back toward him. Tell me what time the swan passed. I am following it. Come out and point the direction. Do you think you can catch up to it, she said. You are foolish. Nonetheless, she went out and pointed the direction she thought he should go. Ojibwe set out slowly. When the sun had risen, he began to travel at his usual speed. He spent the day running, and when night came, he was unexpectedly pleased to find himself near another village. Again he heard a watchman crying out, We are visited! And soon the men of the village came out to see the stranger. He was again told to enter the lodge of the chief, and his reception was in every respect the same as the previous night only that the young woman was more beautiful and received him very kindly. Although he was urged to stay, his mind remained fixed on the object of his journey. Before daylight, he asked the young woman what time the red swan had passed and to point out the way. She did, saying that it had passed the day before when the sun was between midday and Pongishimu, his falling place. Again he set out slowly, but when the sun had risen, he tried his speed by shooting an arrow ahead and catching up to it. On and on he ran, until toward nightfall he came to a small, low lodge. There was a light within. As he approached, he could see an old man sitting alone, warming his back at the fire. Come in, my grandchild, and take a seat, he said. Remove your things and dry them, for you must be fatigued, and I will prepare you something to eat. Ojibwe did as he was requested. When he had eaten, he leaned back and listened as the host began to speak. Young man, the errand you are on is very difficult. Many young men have passed with the same purpose, but none have returned. The red swan you are following belongs to a certain magician who has sent her out over the earth in search of a young man of courage and great daring. A deep sadness bringing shame and dishonor has fallen upon him, and he seeks a deliverer to put an end to his suffering. It is well known in our land that the magician's power resides in a marvelous cap made entirely of wampum, which in former times he wore firmly attached to his scalp. But one day a party of warriors sent by an envious chief caught him off guard, snatched the scalp and made away with it, leaving his head bare and bloodied. 
Several years have passed and still his head has not healed. Meanwhile, the warriors go dancing from village to village, displaying their trophy, calling insults upon it and boasting of their own prowess. With every insult it receives, the magician groans with pain. Many a young man, such as yourself, has been enticed by the red swan in order to rescue the wampum scalp. Whoever is fortunate enough to succeed will receive the red swan herself as his reward. In the morning you will proceed on your way, and toward evening you will come to the magician's lodge. You have been chosen for your skill and your daring, never swerving in your determination. You have followed the swan faithfully, resisting the temptations offered you by hosts along the way. Go forward, my son. Your heart is strong. I have a presentiment you will succeed. I will try, said Ojibwe. And early the next morning he started off. Toward evening he came to the lodge, just as he had been told, and heard the groans of the magician. Upon entering, he was immediately made welcome. You have traveled far, said the magician. You must rest and take something to eat. Removing his leggings and moccasins, Ojibwe sat down beside the fire and looked around him. Strewn about the lodge were heavy furs, robes, brilliant feathers, strands of wampum, and other riches. Yet no sign of life save the magician himself, whose head still appeared bloodied from the loss of his scalp. On one side, however, Ojibwe could see the lodge was partitioned, and every now and then he heard a rustling noise. After he had taken some food, the old magician began to tell him about the lost scalp, how a band of warriors had stolen it, how they dishonored it and brought him great suffering. Then he told of the numerous unsuccessful attempts to regain it. When he had finished, Ojibwe lay down before the fire on a bit of robes that had been prepared for his use. In the solemn quiet of the dimly lit lodge, he gathered his thoughts and imagined the perils of the task that lay ahead of him. As he slept, he dreamed, and in his dream a hawk rose up from the forest. It circled in the air. Again it circled, and again, and again. When he awoke, the magician was standing over him, ready to hand him his things and send him on his way. The sun had not yet risen. Without delay, he made his preparations, and soon he was off on his dangerous adventure. The path he took was remote from the lodgings of men. Not a soul did he encounter along the way. But toward the end of the day, about the time the sun hangs toward home, he heard the shouts of a great many people off in the distance. Looking ahead, he could see a clearing and several men. The closer he came, the more he saw. Still more came into view as he approached the opening, and as he emerged from the trees, their heads appeared as numerous as the hanging leaves. Tense with excitement, he made his way among them. Farther ahead, in the midst of the crowd, he could see a post and something waving on it, the scalp. Off and on, the air was filled with the sound of chanting as they danced around the post. The rush and hum of so many people was like the beating of waves after a storm. Suddenly, in the heat of the throng, he felt a quickening pulse in his arms. His body rose up. Transformed into a hawk, he soared past the heads of the warriors, causing them to jump aside in alarm. Then, with a terrifying scream, he swooped down on the scalp and tore it loose with his talons. The moment they saw what had taken place, they filled the air with the cries, It is taken from us! It is taken from us! Immediately they set out in pursuit, but Ojibwe soared high above them and soon disappeared over the trees. Hearing the scream of the hawk, the magician stepped out of his lodge and began searching the sky for some sign of the young man's return. Soon Ojibwe appeared, and within a matter of moments he stood before his host, changed back to his usual form, holding the wampum scalp in his hands. With tremendous force he brought it down on the magician's head, dealing him a blow so severe that the old man's limbs shot out and quivered in agony. He sank to the ground and remained motionless for a long time, so long that it seemed he would not revive. At last he showed signs of life. His body stirred. He sat up. As he rose to his feet, Ojibwe beheld not an aged man, but one of the handsomest young men he had ever seen. Thank you, my friend, he said. You see that your kindness and bravery have restored me to my former self. It was so ordained, and you have accomplished the victory.
Together they entered the lodge. The young magician urged Ojibwe to remain as his guest, and they soon established a warm friendship. Time elapsed, but still the magician did not speak of the Red Swan, nor was there any visible sign of her presence in the room where they sat. At last the moment arrived for Ojibwe to make preparations for his return. The magician repaid him for his kindness and bravery with gifts of wampum, robes, and all such things as would make him an influential man. But though his curiosity about the Red Swan was at its height, he controlled his feelings. On this subject he felt it would be improper to speak his mind, since the one he had rendered such a service to, whose hospitality he was now enjoying, and who had richly rewarded him, had never so much as mentioned it. His traveling pack was ready, and he was taking his leave when the young magician at last spoke. Friend, I know why it is that you have come so far. You have accomplished your mission and conferred a lasting obligation upon me. Your perseverance shall not go unrewarded. And if you undertake other things in the same spirit as this, you will always succeed. Though I would be happy to go with you, it is my duty to remain here. I have given you all you will need as long as you live. Your reluctance to speak of the Red Swan is most fitting. Yet I vow that whoever rescued my scalp should possess her. He then knocked on the partition. A door opened and the Red Swan appeared. She was a handsome young woman. And as she stood majestically before him, it would be impossible to describe her beauty, for she looked as if she did not belong on earth. Take her, said the magician. She is my sister. Treat her well. She is worthy of you. What you have done for me merits even more. She is ready to go with you to your kindred and friends, and it has been so ever since your arrival. My good wishes go with you both. The Red Swan looked upon her husband with admiration as he bid farewell to his friend. Together, bound by mutual trust and the promise of deep affection, they began the long journey home.